Hello, everybody. As promised, this will be a very short discussion about statistical expectation. It's a follow on from the previous discussion around univariate statistics, and it's a precursor to us getting into specifically parametric distributions. And so this is very timely to get into statistical expectation. So what is statistical expectation? I find for myself the most useful definition is a probability weighted average. When I think that way, when I think about it um, in those terms, it makes sense to me, it gets stuck in my head, and so I think that's a good way to, to go about it. It can also be thought of as the average of a distribution. You have a random variable, it has a specific distribution. The statistical expectation would be the average of that distribution. So let's take a discrete or categorical case right here. In that case, the expectation would be calculated as literally a, you could see it as a probability weighted average of all the possible outcomes. And so we have a distribution here, one, two, three, and four are the possible outcomes. And we could assign probabilities based on the height of these bars. This is a normalized histogram, so we are a binned PDF. And so the height of these bars represent the probability of being or the next sample um, actually coming from each one of these categories. And you'd imagine that the sum of the probabilities of all of these bins would be equal to one in due to the fact of closure. You expect the probabilities to sum, sum to one. So this could would be the expected value for a discrete variable. For a continuous variable, we just extend that. And the way I like to think about it is I could imagine each one of those bars, we could in fact shrink them down. They get thinner and thinner and thinner. And in that case, we would go all the way down to the point where the bars have an infinitesimal size. They're vanishingly small. And that's effectively the concepts behind calculus. And so we'll find that we solve that summation in that case by using an integration over the entire possible range of outcomes going from negative infinity to infinity. And we are then taking the value multiplied by a probability, in this case being supplied since we've gone infin infinitesimally small, by the density available from the PDF. And we would expect once again for closure that the summation from in negative infinity to infinity of that PDF would be equal to one. And we discussed that before when we were talking about um, PDFs and CDFs and so forth. And so this would be how we would calculate an expectation from a distribution. Now, how do we compare statistical expectation and average? And so the first thing is that the expected value for a random variable is the long run average if you take enough samples. So if you calculate the average of enough samples from a distribution, that is the expected value. Okay. The second thing is that sometimes you have a phenomenon for which you don't have a distribution. You don't have a whole bunch of samples from a population. What instead you have is a set of discrete scenarios. Think about a decision tree or something like that, where you have possible different outcomes. In that case, you could imagine calculating the expected value of that by taking the possible outcomes and assigning probabilities to each of them, and those probabilities would sum to one. Now, in that case, if the probability of each one of them, in fact, it's like uniformly distributed across the cases, then if those probabilities are each equal to each other, then the expected value is once again just the average. And that's pretty straightforward. Once again, for discrete and continuous random variables, for the discrete distribution, the expected value is simply going to be the product, um, the, uh, sorry, the, sorry, the sum of the product of all of the probabilities multiplied by their values. And I represent that as a, um, as a population average, or mean. And the reason I put a cat here 
is I recognize the fact that there are cases like if we imagine that the values x are representing a variable that is categorical, it may not make complete sense to look at this mean of the categories. For instance, if we have faces 1, 2, 3, and 4, saying that the average, if they were all uniform, was 2.5 may not be very meaningful. In the continuous case, we can see, just as we showed on the previous slide, the continuous distribution average or expectation average shown here are both calculated by simply taking the integration negative infinity to infinity of the values multiplied by the probability density from the PDF. So let's take a discrete scenario case. This, I think, um, it's important to understand this case. And so this, ha this actually often occurs when you have certain categories of events that are possible, but they don't all have the same probability of occurring. And so our discrete cases could be grain size in millimeters, and they each may have a probability of occurrence. And so we could say um, we have 10 millimeters with a 10% probability, 20 millimeters with a 50% probability, all the way on to 50 millimeters with a 10% probability. The percentages all sum to 100%. Go ahead and calculate the expected grain size. Now I'll give you, um, of course, you, you can take whatever time you want, pause me, and I'll give you the answer in three seconds. Three, two, one. And so this is a very straightforward case where we can go back to the equation from the previous slide and calculate expectation as a probability weighted average of the possible classes, categories, or cases. And so we have a 10 millimeters with a 10% probability, 20 with a 50% probability, and so forth. And if you apply and complete this calculation, you'll find that you have a 27 millimeter for the expected value of these cases given the probabilities assigned to each one of them. And that could be very useful for decision making. You now have that. Now, we should understand the behavior of expectation. How does it behave? Now, the expectation, interestingly enough, is a linear operator. And so it has a variety of very nice properties to it. First of all, the expectation of a constant is simply equal to the constant. Just put a number in your head. The expectation of 10% porosity is equal to 10%. If the distribution was simply a constant distribution with only one value, it makes sense that the expectation is a measure of average of the distribution or central tendency of the distribution. It makes sense the value should be equal to that one possible value, the constant. The expectation of a random variable, our random variable shown as x here, plus a constant, note random variables are always going to be capital letters, x, y, z, and so forth, plus a constant is simply equal to the expectation of the random variable plus the expectation of the constant. The expectation of the constant is equal to the constant. And so this is a nice example demonstrating the distributive property of expectation. Very useful. There's many cases in which you're going to be able to use this. The expectation of a product of a random variable and a constant is going to be equal to the constant multiplied by the expectation of the random variable. So what have we done? We were able to separate out and take the expectation, the, the constant has a, the expectation of a constant is equal to a constant. We're able to just pull it out. We're fine. The expectation of the addition of two random variables is equal to x and y are my random variables, is equal to the expectation of the x plus the expectation of y. This is very useful too. If you have a problem where you have multiple components, you can separate them out. The expectation of a product of two random variables, if independent, is equal to the expectation of the first random variable times the expectation of the second random variable. This only works if x and y are independent of each other. This symbol here representing independence between the two variables. Okay, that's the only time we can do that. So we have to check for independence before we go ahead and do that. Now, 
I think this is a very good example for a couple of reasons. First of all, it shows how expectation is used in calculating a commonly known and discussed statistic, the variance that we just discussed in the last unit. It also applies, this approach will apply most of the relationships and properties, I should say, of expectation that we just discussed. And why else? It shows us that we can calculate a variance in a very simple manner. For instance, we are used to the definition of variance of thinking of it as being the average square difference between all of the values in the data set minus the mean. Now, we don't use average here, we just say expectation, and that is fine. So we have the expectation, as long as we have enough samples, the expectation of all of our values from the distribution. Subtract out the expectation of that, um, of that random variable, which is equal to the mean. Now, we show that this is equal to, or you're going to show in fact, and we'll go through it together, that this is equal to the expectation of the square of the random variable minus the square of the expectation of the random variable, which is equal to its average, so the square of the average. This is very useful because if you were to calculate a variance like this, it's a two-step process. You have to first know the mean, and then you go ahead and apply that for another loop, taking the difference of the squares of all the values minus the mean. If you do it like this, you can do it all in one step you don't actually know, need to know the mean. You calculate the mean and the square of the variable, uh, the random variable, all in one step. And so this is more efficient. Okay, so let's take these relationships that we learned previously. Let's also, and I, I should add on this one here, the expectation of an expectation is simply equal to the expectation. The average of an average is equal to an average. Kind of cool, right? And this one we already talked about, the distributive property shown right here. Take those and let's go ahead and, and we'll go ahead and work this out. I will give you, um, well, <laughs> sorry, I keep saying that. You go ahead and take the time you need. I will review the answer in three, two, one. Okay, so what have we done? Well, the first thing we did was we took this left-hand side and we expanded the quadratic. We do that, so we got x minus the expectation of x squared, and we do that, and we will get this, these three terms now. We have the expectation of x squared minus 2, x times the expectation of x, plus the square of the expectation of x. Now, remember the distributive property of the expectation. We can pull out all three of these components and take the expectation of each one of them separately. So we get the expectation of x squared. So far, so good. We get the two, well, actually what we get is the expectation of 2x times expectation of x, but 2 is a constant. Let's just pull that out right away. And so we get 2 times expectation of x times the expectation of x. And then we got here on this side, we would have the expectation of the squared of the expectation of x. Now, the expectation of x is equal to a constant. It's the mean. It's the average. Therefore, the square of that is a constant, so we can immediately just get rid of that. With the expectation of a constant equal to a constant, we're good. We're just keep it like that now. Okay, let's go another step here. If we if we go ahead and we look right here, um, if we look sorry, if we look right here, we get the expectation of x times the expectation of x. Now. The expectation of x, well, we're in a situation where the expectation of the expectation is equal to the expectation. And so we can, in fact, just pull out the expectation. Plus, we know the expectation of x is going to be equal to a constant. So we can just go ahead and pull that out, and we get 2 times the expectation of x times the expectation of x. Okay, so we got that part figured out now. And now we can further simplify, and we can say on this second term, it's equal to minus 2 times the expectation of x times the expectation of x is simply going to be the square of the expectation of x. And now we're basically done. We just can eliminate this term right here, and we're down to one negative expectation of x squared, and we put it down here. And we have now completed the proof. We have shown that this is equal to this because of our knowledge of expectation 
and understanding how expectation behaves. And we have a calculation for the variance. You can go ahead and prove it with a set of numbers in Excel very easily. And it's very powerful. You can do it very quickly. And so that was useful. So let's finish up right now by summarizing. Why is it important to understand expectation? Well, first of all, expectation is widely used for decision making. Often you hear about management, the decision makers, talking about project expected net present value. And so they're making decisions based on understanding expectation in that context. So it's good for us to understand expectation too. It provides powerful methods to work with expected expectation based problems. A good example is in the subsurface. You often you want to figure out something like the expected resource within the subsurface and you have multiple units that you need to aggregate. It's very useful to understand that you can take the expectation of all of those units summed up is equal to the expectation of each one of those units. And that allows you to work with each of them separately and then combine them together. Also, in, in conclusion, many theoretical developments in geostatistics and proofs are really based on expectation. In a couple of units, we'll talk about the derivation of the Kriging system, and you'll find that it relies on the use of expectation and the operators associated with expectation. So that's the end of our discussion. Expectation. Useful for decision making. A great measure of centrality or central tendency of a distribution. And it'll make you more powerful because you'll understand some of the theoretical developments and you'll be able to figure out analytical relationships to solve kind of complicated expectation-based problems. All right, I hope that was helpful to you. I'm always open to suggestions or other topics people want to hear. And I'll continue working my way through the rest of my geostatistics undergrad course and putting it online for outreach for anyone who wants to learn about geostatistics. All right, thank you.